is our first annual Mike Mansfield lecture. It's dedicated to the lifetime achievements of Mike Mansfield, who lived from 1903 to 2001. As most of you know, Mike was a Montana and a political leader and a diplomat. He served in the House of Representatives, and from 1961 to 1977, he was Senate Majority Leader. His thoughtful statesmanship, political finesse, and humble personality gained him respect on both sides of the aisle. As Senate Majority Leader, Mansfield relied on respect, accommodation, and persuasion to get his way. In the process, he democratized the Senate. It was said of Mansfield that he changed the attitude and character of Congress as much as any leader in its history. Senator Mansfield was held in high esteem nationally and internationally. His expertise in Asian affairs led to his extensive tenure as U.S. Ambassador to Japan from 1977 to 1989. In fact, he was very popular with the Japanese because he actually brewed and served the coffee himself which was very appreciated by the Japanese and their um, understanding of honor. Mansfield numerous honors include the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Thanks to a very generous donor, we're able to now have the Mansfield Lecture Series that really promotes a spirit of inclusivity and a vision of global collaboration while playing, paying homage to this remarkable public servant from our home state. So as we kick off <coughs> our inaugural Mansfield Lecture on our 50th anniversary, I want to share with you a little bit about our speaker tonight, the Honorable Mark Roscoe, former governor of the state of Montana. Governor Roscoe is local. He was born in Thompson Falls and graduated from Libby High School. And in 1966, he was on that infamous basketball team that won the championship in Butte. He earned a bachelor's degree in English from Carroll College in 1970, where he was a starting basketball player there. Following that, he earned a law degree from the University of Montana as an Army ROTC graduate, Governor Roscoe served as the chief prosecutor for the largest U.S. military jurisdiction in Europe from 1973 to 1976. He then served as deputy county attorney for Missoula County from 1976 to 77. And then from 1977 to 88, he was special prosecutor for the state of Montana, during which time he lost only two cases. As Attorney General of Montana, he served from 1988 to 1993, and most of you know him as Governor of Montana from 1993 to 2001. He was appointed Chairman of the Republican National Committee by President George W. Bush in 2001, and served as President George W. Bush's reelection campaign chairman in 2003. He then served as President of the American Insurance Association from 2005 to 2009. I was very privileged when I worked in Helena in the um, early to mid-90s to work with Governor Roscoe, and I can say that he is very committed to the support of public education. In the 26 years I've been in public education in Montana, he was the only governor to attend every Higher Education Board of Regents meeting and to always weigh in on the issues and share his thoughts about how important public education is. So I could tell you a lot of wonderful stories about Governor Roscoe and what a special person I think he is and what a great um, legislator and um, governor He's been, but I just, it's my honor to introduce to you Governor Mark Roscoe. Thank you, dear. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Karras, very much. It, um, it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to appear in front of a crowd and to be cross-examined, but I'm very much looking forward to it tonight. Uh, in all of my previous um, times of having had that privilege, I haven't had to have the benefit of glasses. And as I look at my wife here this evening, I realize it's an entirely different adornment than what I'm used to. And um, it also reminds me that I'm getting somewhat older, uh, unfortunately. But I'm delighted to be here tonight, and this really is an extraordinary privilege for me to be here this evening, and it, for a number of different reasons, it's an extraordinary privilege. First of all, I've been a witness to the birth and evolution of this distinguished institution of higher learning for the last 50 years. When it was founded in 1967, I had just completed my freshman year in college, and during the summer of that year, I was working for the Montana Department of Highways counting vehicles passing in every direction on the corner of First Street and Main in front of what was then Kelly Furniture. Most assuredly now, 
my efforts would not be viewed through the same lens of historical recollection with the same degree of importance as the founding of Flathead Community College. But I was here then, and I somehow became aware of the fact that an entirely new educational enterprise was being launched, probably because I was close to the VFW when I was counting cars, and I believe that that was one of its first homes. Little did I know how far it would go, but with a look back and a look around, it is universally recognized that the college has profoundly shaped and continues to shape the quality, the capacity, and the character of all of life in northwestern Montana. So it's a privilege to be here to recognize that fact alone. Secondly, as was mentioned by Dr. Karras, I have known as a friend and a colleague, Dr. Jane Karras, for a quarter century. We worked together while she was working with the Commissioner of Higher Education in Helena, and I remember when she first came to Flathead Valley Community College in 1999. We continued to work together until I left state government, and I have watched, without her knowledge, as she has continued to serve the college and the community, first as vice president of the college, and then, for the last 16 years, as its 11th president. She has steered and led the college for almost a third of its history. And with all due respect to her predecessors, who surely provided for a solid foundation, she's presided through the college's most ambitious period of growth. Dr. Karras has done so with humility and hard work, by building partnerships and by proceeding with unimpeachable integrity. You might um, discern quickly that I have unqualified and immeasurable respect for Jane Karras, for the kind of leader and for the kind of human being that she is. And that's the same reason and the second reason I'm delighted to be here tonight. I'm grateful as well for the presence and the purpose of Flathead Valley Community College and for the community, the students, the faculty, the administration, the founders and the staff, both past and present, who have made it and will continue to make it, I'm sure, what it is and what it can become. So it is indeed a pleasure to be with you here tonight. And finally, but just as importantly, I feel privileged to be a part of this first discussion in the Mansfield Lecture Series because it seems especially instructive and constructive at the moment of the, this, the history of our republic, at this moment, for all of us, including leaders of our state and nation, to recall the life, the leadership, and the timeless values by which Mike Mansfield lived and served. But first, a summary and a brief mention that may appear to be a diversion, but I assure you it is not so, of how our ongoing experiment with democracy began, how our union was created in the first place. I refer to the miracle, as George Washington and James Madison called it, that unfolded over a period of 116 days at Independence Hall in Philadelphia from May 25th to September 17th, 1787. To allow us the same starting point, you and I, I would like to recall from your memory, as well as my own, some of the background we all shared during our school years when we first examined the birth of our nation. You'll remember that the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union came into force on March 1st, 1781. It had taken 16 months to draft the articles and over three years, or three, excuse me, 13, no, three years before they were ratified by all 13 states. Without diminishing the importance of the articles, the reality is that the seminal imperative of the, art of the articles was to rename the Second Constitutional and Continental Congress and to preserve the independence and the sovereignty of the individual states. They did little more than legalize what the Continental Congress had already been doing. 
And for our purposes at this moment, suffice it to say, the Articles of Confederation didn't work very well. Without a central government to represent the country with foreign nations, to defend the nation by providing the power to raise a military, or the ability to encourage and regulate commerce, there was instead of a union of states, a growing disorder among states. Perceiving the danger for a new nation, the convention in Philadelphia was called by the Confederation Congress to amend and to improve the Articles of Confederation. What happened at the convention, however, was something quite different and extraordinary. For by the end of 116 days, its delegates had agreed to go far beyond amending the Articles of Confederation and instead crafted a constitution for the United States of America. It was ratified by the required majority of nine states barely 10 months later. A miraculous turn of events, unparalleled in recorded history. Perhaps it is providence rather than coincidence that we remember and discuss our beginnings tonight after the nation celebrated Constitution Day yesterday. How was it possible for our founders to do what they did? In the first place, political parties were not yet identified nor operative. In addition, the delegates were all in the same room at the same time at Independence Hall. And there were procedural rules of conduct agreed upon and observed. There were no cameras or reporters in the room. In fact, the proceedings were conducted in secret in order to prevent rumors and false information from circulating in the colonies. Each state had one vote, and a majority of a state's delegates had to be present, and they had to agree before that state's vote counted. Each delegate could speak only twice on each issue until all of the delegates had had the opportunity to speak, and then only with the special permission of the convention delegates. The rules explicitly required the dele delegates to pay close attention to the presentations by other delegates, and it forbade expressly the reading of books, documents, or papers while one of the delegates was speaking. <laughs> Thank God there were no smartphones so that <laughs> that potential crisis was avoided from the beginning. Finally, all of the comments were required to be addressed to the president in order to avoid as much as possible elevated rhetoric between delegates involved in the same exchange. Now, clearly, I want to make plain, the rules of procedure in isolation were not singularly responsible for the good work done by the members of the convention. But unquestionably, in my view, they contributed to an environment conducive to thoughtful and respectful debate and resolution on issues of extraordinary import with very little margin for error. A couple of final thoughts about the convention, the delegates and the spirit within which they deliberated. It is unmistakably clear that the delegates were men of strong and independent views. But it is likewise true that they universally and in good faith worked for consensus. They began and continued for 116 days to talk it out with the hope and belief that they could come to consensus, which they ultimately accomplished. As for the spirit of the federal constitution and convention effort, it would be impossible to describe it any more succinctly or eloquently than Catherine Drinker Bowen. The spirit behind it was the spirit of compromise. Seemingly no noble flag to rally around. <clears throat> compromise can be an ugly word, signifying a pact with the devil, a chipping of the best to suit the worst. Yet in the Constitutional Convention, the spirit of compromise reigned in grace and glory. As Washington presided, it sat on his shoulder like a dove. 
Men rise to speak, and one sees them struggle with the bias of birthright. Merchant against planter, south against north, east against west. One sees them change their minds, fight against pride, and when the moment comes to admit their error, if the story is old, the feelings behind it are as new as Monday morning. Now, how is all of this connected or relevant to a discussion of the life and leadership of Mike Mansfield? And as well, to our political affairs in 2017. Simply put, it is my suggestion to you this evening that Mike Mansfield was cut from the same cloth as those patriots who became delegates to the Federal Convention in 1787. That it was his character, his values, and the manner and method of his leadership that led to his success and to his universal recognition as one of the most consequential leaders in the history of our state and nation. Mike Mansfield's beginnings were humble and difficult indeed. He was born on March 3rd 1903 in New York City, the son of Irish immigrants. His mother, Josephine, died of pneumonia when he was three years old. He was sent by his father, Patrick, who was a porter in Greenwich Village at a hotel along with his two sisters to Great Falls, Montana, to live with his great aunt and uncle who owned a grocery store. He ran away more than once, and for a time, lived at the state orphanage in Twin Bridges. At 14, a month shy of his 15th birthday, Mike Mansfield dropped out of school. He lied about his age and he enlisted in the United States Navy shortly before the United States entered World War I. He went on numerous overseas convoys on the USS Minneapolis, but was discharged early in his view after his real age was discovered in 1919 only to thereafter enlist after he had turned 16 years of age in the United States Army. He served in the Army Medical Corps for a year before serving two years in the Marine Corps, which took him to the Philippines, China, and Japan, and enkindled within him a lifelong interest in Asia. After his honorable discharge from the Marine Corps in 1922, Mike Mansfield returned to Montana, 19 years old, with a seventh grade education, and went to work as a mucker in the copper mines of Butte. It was in Butte that Mike Mansfield met Maureen Hayes, a young school teacher, who encouraged him to continue his education. She sold what she had invested in her life insurance policy provided financial support, and in 1933, Mike Mansfield received his bachelor's degree along with a master's degree in 1934, and shortly thereafter began teaching at the University of Montana. In 1940, Mike Mansfield sought the Democratic nomination for the United States House of Representatives, but he was defeated soundly in the primary election, coming in third out of the three candidates who were running. He ran again for Congress in 1942, this time successfully, and began a period of public service to the people of Montana and the United States that lasted 45 years and spanned five decades. Mike Mansfield served in the House of Representatives for 10 years and in the Senate for 24, 16 of those years as majority leader, longer than any other senator in history although he never wanted the job in the first place. He worked with and counseled nine presidents, five Democrats and four Republicans, and was named by two of them, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, ambassador to Japan, a post he held for 10 years, also longer than any person in history. Mike Mansfield reluctantly assumed the duties of Senate Majority Leader in 1960 at the urging of President Kennedy. In comparison to his predecessor, Lyndon Baines Johnson, he took a distinctly different approach to his duties. 
and was subjected to substantial criticism by the media and his fellow Democrats for doing so. On November 22nd, 1963, Senator Mansfield was set to deliver a speech on the floor of the Senate, addressing the quality and character of his leadership, as well as how the business and deliberations of the Senate should proceed. Just before the time set for him to share his remarks, however, the members of the Senate were informed that President John Fitzgerald Kennedy had been assassinated. At that moment, Mike Mansfield entered his remarks into the record because, as he later disclosed, he had no heart to deliver them. Those remarks, however, provided an insight into the workings of Mike Mansfield's character and capacity for leadership. It provided an intimate and honest look into his heart. After retiring as ambassador to Japan and in our conversations in the 1990s, he began to grow more and more concerned with the polarization of American political life. And as a result, when he was invited by Senator Trent Lott to inaugurate a Senate lecture series in the old Senate chamber in March 1998, he finally dusted off that speech from 1963 and delivered it to his colleagues. He began by quoting Lei Tsao, a Chinese philosopher of ancient times, who said, quote, a leader is best when the people hardly know he exists. And of that leader, the people will say when his work is done, we did this ourselves. He continued with the following remarks. I turn finally to the recent criticism which has been raised as to the quality of the leadership. Of late, Mr. President, the descriptions of the majority leader, of the senator from Montana, which have ranged from a benign Mr. Chips to glamorless to tragic mistake. It is true, Mr. President, that I have taught school although I cannot claim either the tenderness, the understanding, or the perception of Mr. Chips for his charges. I confess freely to a lack of glamour. As for being a tragic mistake, if that means, Mr. President, that I am neither a circus ringmaster, the master of ceremonies of a Senate nightclub, a tamer of Senate lions, or a wheeler and dealer, then I must accept, too, that title. Indeed, I must accept it if I am expected as majority leader to be anything other than myself, a senator from Montana who has had the good fortune to be trusted by his people for over two decades and done the best he knows how to represent them and to do what he believes to be right for the nation. Insofar as I am personally concerned, these or any other labels can be born. I achieved the height of my political ambitions when I was elected senator from Montana. When the Senate saw fit to designate me as majority leader, it was the Senate's choice, not mine. And what the Senate has bestowed, it is always at liberty to revoke. But so long as I have this responsibility, it will be discharged to the best of my ability by me as I am. It would not, even if I could, presume to be tough-mindedness with which, all due respect to my colleagues, I could proceed. I have always had difficulty distinguishing from soft-headedness or simple-mindedness those who are tough-minded. I shall not don any Mandarin's robes or any skin other than that to which I am accustomed, in order that I may look like a majority leader or sound like a majority leader, however a majority leader is supposed to look or sound. I am what I am, and no title, political facelifter, or image maker can alter it. I believe that I am, as are most senators, an ordinary American with a normal complement of vices and, I hope, virtues of weaknesses and, I hope, strengths, 
As such, I do my best to be courteous, decent, and understanding of others, and sometimes fail at it. And finally, within this body, I believe that every member ought to be equal in fact, no less than in theory, that they have a primary responsibility to the people whom they represent to face the legislative issues of the nation, and to the extent that the Senate may be inadequate in this connection. The remedy lies not in seeking shortcuts, not in cracking of non-existent whips, not in wheeling and dealing, but in an honest facing of the situation and a resolution of it by the Senate itself, by accommodation, by respect for one another, by mutual restraint, and as necessary adjustments in procedures of this body. The constitutional authority and responsibility does not lie with the leadership. It lies with all of us, citizen and servant alike, individually, collectively, and equally. And in the last analysis, deviations from that principle must in the end act to the detriment of this institution and this nation. And in the end, that principle cannot be made to prevail by rules. It can prevail only if there is a high degree of accommodation, mutual restraint, and a measure of courage in spite of our weaknesses in all of us. It can prevail only if we recognize that in the end, it is not the senators as individuals who are of fundamental importance. In the end, it is the institution of the Senate. It is the Senate itself as one of the foundations of the Constitution. It is the Senate as one of the rocks of the Republic. Now I share his words with you because no one could more articulately describe what it is that we ought to be talking about in this day and age in the political life of our country. The rest is, as they say, history. Mike Mansfield presided as majority leader in the United States Senate during a period of historic intense and prolific legislative activity focused on civil rights, voting rights, the Vietnam War, the Watergate investigation, and so much more, it would be impossible to describe it all tonight. Many of you in this room were witness to all of it. You know as a matter of instinct the tumultuous and difficult days of turmoil and trial that this country went through during those years. The way he led the Senate, however, and engaged with the minority leader, Republican Ed Everett Dirksen, throughout the long months of debate and filibuster of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is illustrative of his simple, his honest, his fair, and his effective leadership. It's how he did virtually everything. It is also remarkably similar, if you think about it for a moment, to how George Washington presided over the deliberations of the Federal Convention in 1787. And the results in both instances, I would suggest to you, were much the same. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, during a very tumultuous and difficult period of unrest, ultimately passed the Senate on a bipartisan vote of 73 to 27. The next year, Senators Dirksen and Mansfield together introduced the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and it too passed with 77 ayes and only 19 nays. We simply should not be convinced that it cannot be done. Again, the words of Mike Mansfield, I've always felt that the true strength of the Senate lay in the center, not on the right and not on the left, but those, with those people who could see both sides and were so, not so convicted of their own assumptions that they couldn't listen or wouldn't listen to the other side. Differences can be abridged, solutions can be found, concessions can be made. It is much better to take an inch than to take nothing at all. I don't believe that winning is everything, though it is very desirable. I don't think there's anything wrong in losing, however, if you do it the right way. On his headstone, 
in Arlington National Cemetery, all that is reflected there is the following. Michael Joseph Mansfield, Private, United States Marine Corps, March 16, 1903, October 5, 2001. What more needs to be said? Thank you. Now, you don't see me leaving easily or quickly, and that's because I've been instructed that we're allowed uh, the opportunity to have some conversation and some cross-examination, if you think appropriate. Um, and um, the floor is open. If there are questions or thoughts that um, you would like to share with other members of the community. We have a mic that and we have a mic uh, that we can talk about Mike with. Senator, Mr. Secretary. I don't have a question, just a comment. Where's the mic? <coughs> Montana misses you. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're a kind man. You, you're the one that got me in all this trouble in the first place. <laughs> when, um, when Bob and I were in college, um, he was at MSU, a much larger institution than I was attending, and he was elected president of the student body. And... I was um, elected at uh, Carroll College, and Joe Mazurik, our dear, dear friend, I was elected at the University of Montana, and um, Chet Blaylock's son was elected in Billings to serve, and you'll have to help me with um, Western Montana was Newell. Newell was at Northern. So there was, um, there was quite a gathering there. All of us later became involved in the political life of Montana. Um, it was Bob who convinced me that I should, um, and Teresa, he had to work very hard with Teresa, as you'll recall, convinced us to jump off the board in 1993. Um, and you were right. It was the uh, most glorious um, opportunity and privilege of my lifetime. So we've been friends a long time. Tell us more about his family, about Anne and about Well, I, I don't think... Um, Maureen and her presence in his life would require to properly and adequately describe it an extraordinary amount of our time and our effort. She was everything uh, to him. Um, I, I was looking over some past comments, and every single time that I had the privilege of being with him and talking with him and smoking our pipes together, although I couldn't smoke his pipe tobacco, it was Sir Walter Raleigh. And it was a bit strong. It was a man's tobacco. And I wasn't um, quite elevated to that level. He talked about Maureen. And, you know, he, um, she had cashed in her life insurance, little though it was probably at the time, encouraged him to finish his education as he was shoveling ore in the pits of Butte, um, and uh, encouraged him to go to to college and the university, provided him financial support. I mean, he frankly said, everything I have ever become, I owe to Maureen. And I recall, and you probably do too, Bob, when we were trying to get his permission to put some statuary in our newly renovated capital of him for his accomplishments and his representation of Montana, he was abjectly in opposition until such time as we told him that Maureen would be standing by him. And at that moment, he consented. And that's the story behind the statuary of Mike Mansfield that sits in our state capitol, only if Maureen was there. And because she was there, he was willing to allow us to go forward with the preparation of that remembrance. She was a scholar herself, a very serious student, she taught him how to be a serious student. And this is something that I think sometimes is missed, but something so critically important, and I know that Bob and Frank and others here would tell you the same thing. 
Studying is important. I see so many people here who are of, of my demographic, old. <laughs> and we all know that the method with which we grew up required us to study and to understand before we articulated. It required us to discriminate carefully and to withhold our judgment until such time as we had sufficient information to draw a final conclusion. It required us to be fair, to respect someone else talking before we set about to talk. And certainly, we didn't have the issues that are associated with spontaneous, instantaneous gratifications and messages that travel at the speed of sound around the planet that we do today. But one of the most important things I learned early on, both in my work as a prosecutor and working for the people of Montana in government, and making decisions about legislative activity that ultimately was their prerogative in a representative way was to study. And Mike Mansfield was an extraordinarily fine student. He understood every issue. He wanted to know about every issue, especially if they concerned Montana. And even if he didn't agree with you, you know, Mike Mansfield was a stern advocate for gun control. And yet, four times, he was elected by the people of Montana with in excess of 60% of the vote. And the reason was because they knew and understood him and trusted him. And they knew he was well informed. And even if they considered this an aberration from a traditional position to be assumed by someone running for office, if it was Mike Mansfield, because of all that he brought to the table, then they were not going to remove their confidence in him. Now, as you look around the country today, I don't know that I can say with some sense of conviction that such things happen today. And my suspicion is, perhaps, this is an issue that we have to address from both sides of the, the equation, both those who hold office and both those who elect them to office. Because after all, it's, at the end of the day, it's our country. But Maureen was critical in all those respects. She convinced him to come out of the mines. She convinced him to go back and finish his high school diploma. She convinced him to go to college. She stood by his side every single day. And as he said, she gave up her own life for mine. So I don't think there was anybody ever more important, nor anybody that he relied upon more. When, Ronald Reagan called him in Japan and asked him to stay on as ambassador. He said, well, I've already got my clothes packed. And Reagan said, well, unpack them. I need you to stay there. The country needs you to stay there. The people of Japan need you to stay there. And he said, well, just a minute. I've got to talk to Maureen. And he didn't even put his hand over the phone. He yelled out, Maureen, it's President Reagan. He wants us to stay another eight years. And he got back on the phone and he said, she said, it's okay, count me in. <laughs> I think that's honestly what it was like virtually every day of their marriage. Much like mine. <laughs> that really wasn't a joke. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, based on your comments, um, do you have any hope that with uh, today's environment and with campaign finance uh, having evolved into the monster that it is, um, do you have hope that we can have some kind of center and compromise and listening uh, that can return to governance in our country? Well, I'm an eternal optimist. <clears throat> My hope is the answer to that question is yes. But like you, I'm, I'm vitally concerned. I can feel it um, in your question. And there, there, I think there are some simple things we could do or that those who serve could do and those who elect them could do and demand. Um, first of all, there, there's a lot of this difficulty that's caused by the intersection of human activity and electronic communications. And the, the fact is, all of those people together at Convention Hall was important. 
you and I here tonight is important. We couldn't make the same judgments about one another. We couldn't open our eyes and look if we weren't personally present. We couldn't consider each other's view or opinion. We couldn't dispel any preconceived notions that we may have come with unless we had the chance with our own eyes to see, with our ears to listen, and ultimately with a heart to feel about a given set of circumstances. They used to meet with each other in the same room, and that was critically important. Now they report to work on Tuesday, they leave on Thursday. So that's one thing that I would change. And when John McCain says we need to get back to regular order, that's one of the things that he's talking about, is getting back to regular order. Um, secondly, I, I think that we need to bring more discipline, more restraint, more respect into our system, and not just among those who are elected, but those who elect them. Our lexicon and our language has gotten bitter and edgy and angry, and that does virtually nothing to provide a situation or a set of circumstances or an environment where you can expect there to be anything civil that comes out of that atmosphere. So I think there are a lot of very simple things that we can do that really have to do with returning to common courtesy and a sense of recognizing that we have been blessed sharing in this experiment of democracy and that we live as free people and that our decency more than anything is important to the cause of freedom. You can live in freedom all day long, but until you respect the freedom of others, um, you can't live, I don't believe, for long in that freedom. It takes decency. I mean, what is it that, that requires people to stop at a four-way stop, especially if our law enforcement officers aren't there? It's, it's concern for others. Well, what is it that allows for a people almost spontaneously with no thought to chain themselves together out into the ocean to grasp two children who are drowning and they don't even know them. So it's innately within us. And, and I believe we set about to do good. Um, but I don't know that we're providing forms within which that can happen. The structure of what we're doing, I think, is amiss. And I was talking with Frank earlier tonight. We were talking about the dynamics of the legislature, even in Montana. The language, the rhetoric, the hyperbole, it does damage, it hurts. And when you do it with instruments that can't retrieve whatever it is that used to vaporize, like smartphones and tablets and computers, it's etched forever. You know, in the campaign of 2000, we used to put together a war room. This is how it was done traditionally. We had 25 or 30 25 to 30 year olds in a war room all night long going over every newspaper of consequence in the country, every TV broadcast, every late night show. There were only three of them then, as you remember. <laughs> and we would distill all those comments by morning. We'd receive a briefing in the morning at 5.30. It might be 5.30 5 in the morning. We'd go over all of those things. We would spend the morning trying to bat down those things we thought that were inaccurate. And then we spend the afternoon trying to advance our own cause to convince the American people we were worthy of their trust. We didn't have campaigns where we set about to create factions. Up until the very day I left politics in 2005, we'd never set about to create factions and then somehow cobble together a plurality, not a majority, but a plurality, because there would be enough division and segmentation we could depend on being successful if we had a plurality. We didn't make promises that we didn't think we could fulfill. We didn't appeal to the, to the, uh, the interest, the, the rebellious interest of people who were angry. The point was to try and put together a working majority. When we came to the legislature, promising what we had promised, we were serious about trying to accomplish what it is that we set about to do. And that's changed. And it's, um, you know, I, I, I've spent a long time in politics in at virtually every level. And every marker that I've had through 40 years of political activity to gauge how the system is unfolding and where the American people might go, I didn't know with certainty, but where I had confidence they would go because they had always leavened all of this, ar this argument and reached a conclusion that I thought 
I could understand and made sense. All those markers during this last year misled me. I, I was totally fooled. And I, come, I came to realize that something was going on in the country that I wasn't aware of because my measuring sticks no longer applied. And I, I fear, genuinely, I'm, I'm not so fearful I'm panicked or, or paralyzed, but I fear for the deliberative processes of our, our, of our country because we're not coming together and trying to distill um, solid policy that's in the best interest of the people of, of this nation. You know, even Ronald Reagan said, better to get 70% of something rather than nothing at all. He may well have been paraphrasing uh, Mike Mansfield. So I'm, yes, I'm worried. I think Frank's worried. Um, where it starts, I think it starts with us. I, I, can know, I know from being a candidate, uh, when there was enough of a swell of opinion and thought coming from good and decent people from a number of different centers of interest and energy, I listened. So we have to be unembarrassed by the notion that something as simple as instructing people how to behave themselves isn't relevant. It's like my mother said, when you put play clothes on them, they're probably going to try to play. And if you don't provide some amount of boundary, then they're going to exceed it. And frankly, with what's gone on with our political deliberations over the course of the last um, time, not universally and not on every occasion, I think it's time for us to issue that warning and demand higher performance. You're, it's really, really terrible to ask me a question because I usually start at Genesis and then I kind of work my way forward. I feel really thorough, though. Yes, sir. Sorry. If I may just offer uh, three quick observations. I used to work with John Melcher. Is that you, Carl? Yeah, it is. Well, you, Carl Rickman. Uh, I, I used to work for John Melcher in the 1970s back in his Washington office. And, of course, I got a chance to work in and around Mike Mansfield, you know, on occasions. And the most poignant memory I have was of sitting in his Senate Majority Leader office with Lee Metcalf and, of course, Mike, and the president of the Anaconda Company, John C.B. Place of New York City, and Mike Mansfield had tears in his eyes uh, pleading with him to keep the Berkeley pit operating at that time. And, they did, and he did for another, I think, about 10 years or so. The second observation, Pat Williams told me uh, three or four years ago that the reason he quit the Congress was because it was no longer fun to be there anymore. It was in the 1990s, it was the divisiveness that he was feeling even then. The third comment, if I may tell a story on you. It's all right on me, not on Teresa though, Carl. Oh no, Teresa's clear. But in 1980, when you ran for Chief Justice of the Montana Supreme Court, and I was running for Secretary of State, and we would go to these dinners together, I remember Frank Haswell, who was the Chief Justice at the time, who you were opposing, um, with his beautiful silver crown of hair, which was even better than yours now, um, <laughs> would pat you on the head verbally and say you were a nice young man whose time would come, and you would respond that you were the same age as Thomas Jefferson when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Well, at any rate, I just thought I'd get nostalgic. Thank you. You know, the interesting thing is, Carl, Frank Haswell, there was never an ill word um, between us. No, I mean, he was an extraordinary man. Yeah. And um, he also presided over the adoption of my brother when he was um, a judge in the 11th Judicial District here in Kalispell, which had jurisdiction over Libby. Always was kind, of, good Marine too, I'll tell you, um, kind to me to the very end. But it, those, uh, those are accurate reflections, Carl, I have to say. Mark, I've got a comment. I was raised in Missoula, and uh, as a boy, I think I was 12 years old, I had a paper route on the northwest uh, corner of Missoula from Broadway to the tracks and from Higgins to the Rattlesnake Creek. And behind the federal building was the Knights of Columbus uh, Hall. And I can remember as a boy, 
I do my collections on Saturday, the businessmen would meet at the hall and have lunch. And I can remember Mike, every time he was in town, he had lunch at the hall. And I can remember him sitting next to me and, and, and striking up a conversation. But I can remember the smell, the pipe, uh, and, and just, you know, he was very impressive as a boy. You know, I, I just, just a comment. That's a, that's a, a warm comment. It um, certainly strikes a chord of recognition within me. When I used to go see him, I, um, I would take my pipe. And, you know, I, I haven't um, been overly demonstrative about smoking my pipe in public, but I'll smoke it virtually any place else I can as often as I can. And um, I can remember going into his office. He, by the way, when you mentioned, Jane, that he would brew his own coffee, he never served anything but instant coffee. <laughs> he, he'd, get out, he'd get out this um, MJB coffee from Mrs. What's-Her-Name, and he had a hot water um, plate on, his, on a tray next to his um, desk, and so he'd, he'd ask you if you wanted a cup of coffee. And I can remember the first time I went in and I said, um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, it's such a great thrill um, and privilege to meet you and see you. And he said, uh, well, Governor, I'd like you to call me Mike. And I said, um, I just don't think I can do that, sir. I, um, I just, I'm, I can't. And he said, well, then I guess it's going to be Governor. Um, did you bring your pipe? And he, um, we drug out our, our pipes, and he had his Sir Walter Raleigh, which was so strong, um, you know, would chase maggots off a trash wagon. And, um, and I had my, my cheerleader tobacco, and um, we'd sit in his office and smoke pipes. I treasure, I feel so blessed to have that memory. And frequently he would invite his best friend, uh, one of his best friends from the Senate, um, who was um, from the state of Baltimore, and um, do you remember, I'm searching for a name now, um, but anyway, he was a Republican, um, and they would both lament what was happening, they felt, to their institution. Mark? Yes. Uh, Bev Bragg from Kalispell Hi, of the Flathead Care Days. Um, we've missed your eloquence in our political life. Thank you for sharing tonight. But would you tell us what you tell your grandchildren about our world and politics and uh, making contributions to society with all the technology? What do you say to your grandkids? I know what you used to say to your kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do, Bill. Um, well, first of all, at our house, when we're gathered as family, there are no screens except at designated moments. Grandma's rule. If you sleep in the treehouse, there are no screens. You can take games, but no screens. Um, if we are together at night, which we almost always are, um, it's game night, not screen night. Um, and, you know, we try to, um, even though we're not their parents, encourage them when they're examining the world around them. And I send them a reading list each day. Now, this is one of the wonderful things about the Internet. I have their email addresses. and. All of my children, their spouses, and my grandchildren. And I don't know if they take me seriously or they don't. But I have a reading list that I compose every day and I dispatch to them for their, for their reading. And I try to balance it, even in our discussions with them. Try to give them both sides of an issue and to make them think um, in a way that uh, is critical and allows for them to distill. You know, I think in us as human beings, there is this meter and this filter and this capacity to weigh and judge. And if you put the right stuff in, almost universally the right stuff is going to come out that people can also agree to. It's just our challenge today is getting people to sit still long enough to get the right stuff in them, have the right stuff thought about, and the right stuff returned. That's all that's missing. We're still the same creatures that God created. We still have the same capacity. Uh, we just need to rediscover how it is that we did what we did when we found our freedom, gave birth to a nation, and governed ourselves in a way that took other people into account. That's all we have to do. I don't know that I know exactly how to do it, but we try to use those instruments, whether it's with religion, with politics. I don't, I don't ask my, anybody how they vote. I don't press them. 
I don't uh, cajole them. I don't leverage them. You know, when Bob and I were serving, there were no deals in the legislature. He had his thoughts. I had mine. I was willing to think about his. He was willing to think about mine. Most of the time, they were identical. But when we dealt with the opposition, we tried to give their thoughts due consideration without violating our principles. And, you know, frankly, I think in the time I was there, eight years, I did not veto more than five bills. Because a bill should be out of the system before it gets to that point. If there's that much difficulty with it, then exit it from the process. And that's, frankly, what happened. So I, I'm, I, when people tell me, well, that's not possible, you know, my response is, that's caca. Um, <laughs> in keeping with my eloquence, Bev. Um, it's been done, and it can be done. And it's done in other venues. You know, in schools, in colleges, in universities, in community colleges, in discussions here. That's the great thing about an academic institution. It's still built around people talking to people and people listening to people. And out of that comes a certain sense of civility. And we have to find institutions that invest civility. Yes, sir, Yeti. Governor, like Bob Brown, um, I, we all appreciate you being here tonight and speaking to us. Uh, I, I have a tough question, uh, I, I think, uh, and a long answer would be appreciated. If, <laughs> if Teresa said, okay, would you run for office again? Well, you know, Eddie, um, the landscape, I suspect, has changed dramatically. I don't think, Bob, they drive around in a pickup truck anymore and um, go to every dinner in 56 counties and put yarn signs all over the landscape that you know win or lose, you have to pick up when it's over um, and go to fundraisers where $200 is a good night. Um, so I know it's different. When the bell rings, I suspect that all of us who have done this are just like everybody who's done anything. You want to run to the truck, you know, you want to race to the fire. And I hear the bell, and I have an incredibly poignant and intense interest. But when I review the landscape, and I think now I'm 69, and I have these five children who in this day and age, contrary to how it was when we were kids, still need as much of their parents and their nuclear family as they can secure. And we have eight grandchildren um, who we are as involved with probably um, as much as anybody could have been at any moment in the history of humankind. And where you think you're important to them and they think you're funny and you can say things that are tolerated now because you're older and you can be outrageous on occasion and you think about being able to steer them and guide them and pick them up and dust them off. It gets hard to think about using, and we all become so conscious of time. You know, it's, it's evaporating and it's going so quickly. Um, so when we talk about it, we feel the urge to want to be of service and to be, you know, ministers of of the effort to be a part of a country that has you know, been a, a, the beacon, the singular beacon to the world for 230 years. But we weigh it against that, and usually, not, it's not the hard work. It's not even the fear of losing. I've lost as much as I've won. You know, winning's better, I'd grant you that, but um, losing's not so hard, and I learned more losing than I ever did winning. But that's that's where we kind of end up each time we talk about it. And, you know, with these third-party groups now, we were somebody mentioned this before with the um, financing. You know, we, we tried to talk John McCain out of the financing structure we have now. He thought, of course, you know, that if you had a place where you could <clears throat> diminish the limits and, and move it uh, into uh, transparency, which is true, but he set into place... Um, a, a process and procedure that forced by osmosis the activity outside the boundaries of traditional parties. 
So you can run for office today, but you can't keep anybody else out of your campaign. What do I mean by that? Well, the Senatorial Committee, they can take a huge amount of, un, uh, of contributions and they can spend it anywhere they want. And you can't stop them. Um, these independent groups that, that put a blizzard on TV, um, which is annoying and aggravating and frankly has very little to do with the truth and is a complete waste of money and time, in my judgment, can't be deterred. And I don't think they influence races in one way or another. Perhaps, but I don't think so. So there are forces out there that didn't used to be there. You know, we dealt with our own mistakes in a campaign. Now you have to deal with everybody else's, and you can't keep them out of there. So there, that's kind of the inventory I go through. Um, sometimes I really want to, because I, I feel like sometimes I could help. Um, but other times I think, who do you think you are? Um, you were lucky to do what you did. You had to take care of the businesses right in front of you. So that's the, the debate. <laughs> that was long, wasn't it? <laughs> You've heard me too many times, Kittle. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, you, you talked about the, uh, the, uh, the founders valuing uh, compromise, and you talked about Mike Mansfield valuing the people in the middle, the best of the Senate, or the ones in the middle. Yet, uh, whether the issue is gun control or abortion or immigration, we tend to, we voters are voting for people on the polls, on the extremes of the continuum. And it, it's been said that it's easy to, to uh, to raise enthusiasm and money for people on the extremes, but how do you how do you rally us voters to support moderation? You know, it, it it's it almost sounds silly to say it, but how do you do how do you get us to vote for somebody who maybe isn't exactly the same as us on immigration, but is a good thinker and will compromise and will uh, will be civil. You know, it's such a profound question, and I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the honest answer. I don't know precisely how to do it, except one person, one candidate at a time. And, you know, we have five children, and they've been involved, they were involved in campaigns for a very long time, um, as, as very, very small children. And they, we, we were a part of the process when it was hallowed and respected and even though efficient, inefficient and full of stumbles and falls and scrapes and bruises, it was still worth it. When they compare what they know from being on the inside of those efforts to what it is that they see and understand today, they too ask themselves, why would I want to be a candidate? And that's a very, very um, hard question f for someone to answer. Because it does take thick skin, it takes just um, undeniable devotion, it takes an ability to see spiritually what it is that you want to accomplish and that you are trying to do something larger than yourself. Um, and so it's difficult not only to find voters who vote that way, it's difficult to find candidates who are willing to behave that way. And maybe that's where we begin, is with candidates and, and, and coalitions. The unfortunate thing is the extremists have been rewarded. And um, that's, I don't know precisely how to stop it. I just know that I am full of anguish about what it is that's going to happen to our country. Not in my time, I don't suspect. But in, in my children's time, and clearly in my grandchildren's time. And we better wake up as a nation, somehow, and smell the coffee, and get ourselves righted, or I think we face the same fate as other free peoples have. Now, I don't, I don't mean to be an alarmist, I, but I honestly think the degradation to the process that has occurred since in the last 10 years, 15 years especially, um, has been dramatic. And it has introduced new tools and weapons 
into the process that are very, very difficult to overcome. You know, when it comes, I mean, even me, I can tell it working on me. You know, when I get up in the morning, I want to click on that, that um, tablet to see what's happened overnight. And you start mainlining, you know, spontaneity and instantaneous results. And um, we haven't learned how to live with that yet. And, and I think now you complicate that even worse by so much misinformation out there and disinformation. I was interested in um, the little article that was in the Beacon about me being invited to do this presentation. And I've seen this before. I wrote an editorial piece this summer um, trying to encourage the Republican convention to select somebody other um, than the candidate that they were contemplating. And there were all kinds of comments below that particular article in the Post, probably a thousand. And after about the third or fourth one, these commenters got into a battle with each other that really had absolutely nothing to do with me. And um, that kind of, you know, this, this grates on people. We, we're delicate creatures in a lot of ways. And so I think, you know, we're, we're disturbing. Um, we're all becoming disturbed and angry and bitter and spontaneous and, and not thinking um, through. And those things are so hard to withdraw. Um, you know, those 20, uh, that's really what happens in Congress. These guys report and, and ladies report to work in the morning and there's 15 tweets you know, telling them they're rocket man or um, that, you know, they, they're, they're not worthy of any kind of consideration or they're, it, it's too bad they're so misinformed and before they even get to work. Well, that, that doesn't help a lot. Um, so I don't know how to solve all those problems. But I, I do know that, that us, together, as a community of interest, with different opinions, and, and a divergence of view, um, but people of genuine goodwill can have some power if there's somehow they can organize it and channel it. I'm still trying to discover that. See, I suspect that there would be those who would laugh if that was your platform. But you know what? Um, if you have the courage to advance it, I think honestly when you think about it, it makes sense. It's just like going through what they did in the convention, going through how Mike Mansfield worked, going through how other respected leaders lead. I mean, Frank, you know, led an effort to raise taxes. In my, re in my memory, you were raising the infrastructure. I know it's time to go, Frank, but the fact is, <laughs> but the fact is that he had the courage to take a look at something that the entire community needed. And he had the courage to talk about how to get it accomplished. And he had the courage to introduce a bill when there no, was not unanimity of consent. And he came out of that sec session more highly respected, not only by his peers and his mates, but by virtually every ci other citizen in the state of Montana, because he did what was right. And at the end of the day, my guess is, in November of next year, Frank is going to realize that everybody that took the time to review what it is that he did found that his reasoning, just like they found Senator Mansfield reasoning, was right. So if we can find more people like Frank, I think that we can raise the um, possibility significantly. You have been very patient. I'll say as long as you, you want to. Um, so if there are any other comments, yes, sir. I won't ask you a question or, or uh, you may give us your opinion, but uh, I think that uh, we have an opportunity in our president who we have for another three years, who is leaning towards the middle a person that's not committed to the right or to the left, but who actually is thinking about many of the issues that we are facing. And in response to the question this fellow had over here, I think that as of the last election, the people have spoken. And these are the people that don't live on the East and West Coast, but I think who are truly Americans, who are thoughtful, and who want to get her done. 
And I think that this president is devoted to doing that. And we've seen that movement. And I think that all of us as uh, citizens and Americans and as neighbors and family need to recognize this. This isn't a short-term thing, you know, and we're, we're, we have this fellow, we have this president, our president, for three more years at least. And I think that we all should be thinking in a more comforting way. I couldn't, I don't think I could disagree with anything that you said. <clears throat> the, um, the fact of the matter is, he is our president. And the fact of the matter is, all of us wish him well. Um, and I think he had probably the most unbelievable opportunity uh, to be successful of any candidate elected president in my adult life because he was not beholden uh, to any interest when he was elected. At the same time, how you behave, how you act, the chivalry with which you represent, just like you and I presently discussing, listening to each other carefully, you have to display at the highest levels of the executive branch of government. And you can't be trite or small. You're the only person on the planet that occupies that, that particular responsibility at this time. It does not mean you can't be direct. It does not mean that you can't draw lines in the sand. But it does mean that you ought to conduct yourself in a way that reflects a level of civility and sophistication and attachment to the human race that you're willing to accord every other person respect. Now, I think... So I don't disagree. And I think you're absolutely right about the, the number of electors who voted for Donald Trump crosses a wide, wide swath of different interests and energies across the country. I know I have family members that were supportive. I know some people who were angry who were supportive. Some people who have distinctly different views were supportive. But there were also some people who were supportive because he insinuated certain things that may not have appealed to their better angels. And that's the wrong thing to do in my judgment. When you know you can't accomplish it in the first place, when you shouldn't accomplish it in the second place, and at the end of the day, where you essentially are not reflecting things in an accurate life. Now, let's just take the dreamers, for instance. The, the fact of the matter is, every person here, but for those that we live with who are native to this um, part of the planet, came from somewhere else. It's just a simple fact. That's where my ancestors came from. It's where everybody's came from. We have always had immigration into this country that has provided for an opportunity for diversity, for fresh workforce, for new energy, for new insight. Uh, many who are more than willing to accept to come here to provide us scientific expertise and research capacity. We've always been a nation of Im immigrants. And to categorize all of them with one broad swath of description and to denigrate or to appeal to the worst side of our nature in order to make an argument that's political in nature and perhaps secure more, more support in an electoral conduct contest is wrong, in my judgment. And the fact is that's a solvable problem. And if both sides would quit yelling at each other, we could get it done fairly quickly. I'll bet you and I could solve that problem in a day's time. And, and that's what I'm saying is as the only person occupying that office right now, how you say things, when you say things, to whom you say things is important. And if you want to call your fellow citizens to a higher plane of discussion and to a fair consideration of the issues, then don't be unfair yourself. And that, I think, is something we need to push him on. You know, step up to the plate and hit the ball. But quit yelling at the umpire. Thank you, Jane, so much for this privilege. And um, thank you for the opportunity to be with all of my friends and acquaintances and to my fellow citizens in this glorious part of the state of Montana. Um, and thank you too for all that you did to um, stop the forest fires. I really appreciate it. <laughs>